so obviously this is very much ideologically driven. Uh, this is neocon neoliberal concert of, you know, of political powers uh, that uh, cannot stand the thought of Georgia not jumping or asking or telling them that they're not going to jump as high as they want them to jump anymore. This is as simple as that. Um, and obviously, uh, they understand that this the Georgia is getting away from them. But here is the here is a counterintuitive point here for many. Uh, I don't think they can do much about this. I don't think Brussels or Washington can do much about this, no matter how much they scream and yell and criticize this current government. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking again to Georgi Lasha Kasaradze. Uh, Lasha is an international relations analyst who focuses on the uh, states of the former Soviet Union and security dynamics in the South Caucasus and the wider Eurasian geopolitical space. He has written for several outlets like the Center for New America, New Eastern Europe and the National Interest. Since 2020, he works in the US as a liaison officer for the Sokumi State University. Lasha holds degrees in international relations from Rollins College and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy of Tufts University. Lasha, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Pascal. It's uh, great to be back. Uh, you are my go-to expert when it comes to the Caucasus, and uh, I've talked recently to a German colleague of mine, uh, David Noack, also about what happened in Georgia, but today we've learned that what has been widely expected actually happened, which is that the Georgian parliament overwrote the veto of the president and actually passed this bill that has been in the news, especially in Western news, for, for a whole while, the which is uh, called this Transparency on Foreign Influence Bill that in the West has been dubbed a, a Russian, pro-Russian law, and that has been also protested in Georgia quite heavily over the last couple of weeks, and that had been in the making for a long time, actually. And so... With this over overriding of the of the president's veto, who said no to this, um, what are your initial thoughts about? Let's say first about the the parliament overriding the the president. What can I say? Uh, I I the way I look at this, uh, Pascal, is that um, this is basically uh, the what's happening is that Georgia is basically waking up from the dogmatic slumber. To quote Kant. Uh, uh, to use the title of his uh, classic work. Uh, uh, and they're basically saying, um, you know, they have to take a step back and reevaluate. Reevaluate perhaps is a strong word, but to analyze further and more accurately, more deeply, uh, the entire 30 year period, uh, which has been this extreme one-sided pro-Western uh, political stance uh, in Georgia, starting from its independence in 1991, all the way up to uh, 2012, uh, with the conclusion of the uh, rule of Georgia by the uh, United National Movement as a result of their defeat uh, uh, by the uh, George, current Georgian dream government. Um, and I want to be very careful here. This Contrary to what we hear in the West, it has no evidence, uh, this entire process, uh, to prove that the Georgian dream has either officially or unofficially uh, uh, made a turn towards Russia or turn against the West. Um, I believe that this has been a the results that the what we have witnessed in Georgia uh, as with, with these large protests um, uh, has been the result uh, of manufactured narratives and outright propaganda. That's the only way one can appraise this. Let me just interject here for a second that at this point, Georgia still has no diplomatic relations with Russia, right? Direct diplomatic relations. They go actually through Switzerland, which is the protecting power for both sides, uh, protecting power, the, the mediator. 
but uh, there is still a very very uh, strong conflict between Russia Russia and Georgia going on so what I don't understand is why the West keeps framing this as if though Georgia is already in the orbit of Russia I it this makes no sense to me I couldn't agree with you more this is a key point there is no official relationship with Russia um the Georgian government, when I say there is no evidence, has gone out of its way uh, based on the research that I've done and folks that I've spoken to, my colleagues, about the painstaking process that it took to uh, actually follow through uh, the European path, right? Through uh, which eventually led to the approval uh, by Brussels of Georgia's candidate status. But prior to that, this was an extremely complicated painstaking process, bureaucratic process with checks and balances and strict oversight from Brussels that every single uh, category of this agreement uh, had to be uh, properly implemented uh, and checked by Brussels. So everyone I've spoken to has applauded the Georgian dream uh, in its efforts uh, to make sure that this process uh, was complete and successful. And December of last year, uh, they approved Georgia's candidacy status. So to think that this is, I'm not understanding how they can make an argument that this is a pro, -West, pro anti Western and pro Russian government when the facts on the ground suggest otherwise. Uh, we, again, with the candidate, with the approval of the candidacy status being the the most palpable and obvious and important factual evidence that this is not the case, that Georgia remains strategically to be a pro-Western Republic under the Georgian dream government. What has been happening here is that this, I believe, is sort of the last hurrah, relatively speaking, of Western powers accustomed, particularly of Washington, in Washington, accustomed to basically being comfortable in treating Georgia any which way they want it. Georgia has provided, uh, you know, has been a loyal servant, uh, if, I, if, I, if, I say, if I can phrase it that way, uh, of Washington for the past 30 years, uh, and especially since 2000, and, um, uh, 2000 and, uh, uh, I would say three, since the Rose Revolution, um, including under the tenure of this current government. Um, so this is basically a hysterical reaction, a very undiplomatic, uh, you know, very foolish, in my opinion, uh, because if they truly want to make Georgia uh, turn, get, turn away from the West, uh, this is the way to do it. And to waste the capital, uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, enormous political capital that has been accumulated between the two countries, the United States, well, the United States, European Union, and, and Georgia, in such a way, in such a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, in such a superficial manner, accusing of the current government, which, by the way, they themselves, the elections of which they themselves approved, both Washington and Brussels approved and recognized the elections. Of course, there were problems and uh, certain questionable scenarios, uh, but overall, there is, it is, there is no doubt that the G uh, GD won, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the dramatic difference. Uh, I believe it was uh, 38 percent, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of parliamentary elections, uh, um, and then um, uh, the United National Movement uh, collecting uh, slightly above, uh, I think, 20 percent. Uh, so the the significant difference in votes uh, was uh, obvious, uh, and so um, not to mention the fact that since 2012 they've been winning. Uh, both parliamentary and local elections. Um, uh, so both in terms of their legitimacy and recognition from Washington and Brussels and uh, GD's internal victories, political electoral victories, uh, it is hard to see and uh, it is hard to understand where Washington sort of thinks it's going by uh, by this uh, rejection, such radical rejection uh uh, of Georgia's uh, uh, Georgian dream sort of legitimacy, if you will, because you hear that this government 
uh, needs to be sanctioned and this government needs to be punished one way or the other. And they're basically just reaching sort of a level of absurdity because uh, they're going to be sanctioning the government, the very government that they have themselves recognized and they've supported as part of the entire process of Georgia's uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, joining the West eventually. Uh, so it, it looks, they look very foolish increasingly. Um, the, it, I wonder what the what the game here is. Do you think the West wants Saakashvili back? Uh, because Mr. Saakashvili is currently in prison, right, in Georgia. And I, I don't know, has there been any talk about, has the EU been pressuring or somebody been pressuring Georgia to release Saakashvili? And it seems that they, <laughs> that, that the West is the hell is now set on regime change in Georgia, and the uh, analysis of David Noack is that since they cannot do it through normal parliamentary elections, because it is pretty clear that the Georgian Dream actually has majority support, uh, you have to try to do it differently. You have to try to use the Ukraine playbook and get some sort of popular protest going that gives you the veneer, the facade of uh, of a popular will, which there isn't if you did elections. And then you 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 flip you flip a couple of key figures in in parliament. Um, do you think that's the go that's that's the game at the moment? And if so, then why? Because as you said, like Georgia Dream has been pro Western uh, yeah. in the sense that they that even the 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 intelligentsia and the the, the especially the business class has mm -hmm. most of its connections with the West, not actually with uh, with Russia. But they're not willing to be a second spear tip to be pushed into Precisely. the side of Russia, right, uh, in, in terms of, of, of another bloody war. Precisely. This is why this is so absurd and so ideologically driven, because it's not making any sense, um, any rational sense. And uh, they're, you know, Brussels and Washington are basically uh, are looking increasingly foolish. But to answer your question, you know, the relationship... Um, we all remember what a golden boy Saakashvili was of George W. Bush and his entire uh, sort of uh, uh, political, uh, you know, ilk. Um, you know, starting from John McCain, uh, as much as Georgians and I personally respected the man, and he was truly uh, a supporter of Georgia, undoubtedly. I just disagreed with his philosophy and outlook on U.S. foreign policy, and particularly his views on Russia and the role of Georgia vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. Uh, but be that as it may, the entire sort of um, uh, school of thought, you know, neocon, neoliberal concert in Washington under the George W. Bush presidency um, made Saakashvili its golden boy, its go-to person, um, no questions asked, um, and tolerated with many, now that we know, and Georgian society, even under his rule, obviously understood what was happening, uh, but now tolerated uh, egregious violations of human rights, of uh, property rights, all under uh, the banner of democracy promotion and libertarianism. Uh, the libertarianism part was even more ridiculous because uh, under libertarianism, and I think I mentioned this to you before on your show, uh, you know, they promoted Ayn Rand and, you know, you know, neoliberal economic policies uh, and without home, uh, without uh, uh, that they couldn't do obviously without Reagan. So they even built a small Reagan statue there. Uh, so the whole arsenal of neoliberal sort of political toolbox was um, uh, fully utilized. Um, and under neoliberalism, what they were doing is the government itself was violating pro private property uh, laws uh, of individual uh, entrepreneurs and business owners, etc. So that being said, that lasted for nine years, all under, I would say, not you know, protection um, and legitimacy that the Bush administration sort of created in Washington and around the world, particularly in, 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 uh, in Brussels, uh, of Saakashvili's regime. Uh, so yes, it becomes it's it's been written before that yes, uh, there is a uh, tendency uh, in in Washington to view this government again foolishly and irrationally as more pro-Russian, um, uh, and uh, incomparably more so than Saakashvili. Even though facts on the ground are paradoxical and ironic, because Sa it was Saakashvili under Saakashvili's regime that he brought 
Kaha uh, Bentukidze and made him the uh, the uh, uh, minister of Georgia's economy, uh, who was also an oligarch from Moscow. He made his billion dollars in Moscow, um, um, and he uh, sort of, in a mocking way, was calling himself uh, mockingly was calling himself uh, a, a small oligarch. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, Washington was not saying anything about against that, obviously, right? And what this man did was he sold off every strategic economic asset that Georgia had left over from the Soviet state, from the Soviet system to the Russians. Um, and it was only when Saakashvili decided to go in extreme, uh, take extreme measures and sell off uh, the key strategic weapon that Georgia had, the railway built under the Soviet times, that George W. Bush himself interfered and forbade Saakashvili from selling that strategic asset to Russians. So things were that bad, okay? Um, so to answer your question, to give you a long answer to your question, yes, uh, you know, to this day, that political hypocrisy prevails. That to this day, the George, uh, you know, there is anger in Washington and Brussels that Saakashvili is sitting in jail. Uh, they have acquiesced, obviously, uh, to this fact, and I would even argue wipe their hands off of him. Uh, uh, but um, they certainly use it as a political tool to constantly uh, uh, complain and uh, um, sort of uh, delegitimize Georgia as a democratic, uh, the GD as a democratic uh, uh, government because they were keeping, first of all, Saakashvili came to Georgia himself. Nobody dragged him into Georgia. Um, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, to give you a long answer, yes, absolutely, there is a bias so, there. Yep. And before before we started the recording, you told me uh, that you were very frustrated because, uh, <laughs> you know, Washington repeatedly told Georgia to jump, and the only thing Washington heard from Georgia was like how high. So Correct. in a sense, you you a lot of you and and a lot of others feel weirded out by the fact that Georgia has been so pro Western and still is getting the stick for not for not jumping high enough, yes. uh, apparently. So yeah. the 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 question in my mind then is what what's the what's the, what's the play a, a what's what's the goal here and b who are the people on the ground? I mean, there's, there's thousands of protesters. There's, there's no question, although it is not that difficult to rally up th thousands of protesters, right? Um, the Do you have any connection with anyone who's who's actually, who seriously opposes this law, which it is a law about transparency. It's a law that says anyone who receives more than 20% of foreign funding uh, as an NGO has to declare that and has to keep a register, which is something the United States is doing, something which the European Commission actually proposed it proposed yeah. registers it proposed to have a a, a, a a directive which means that all the member states have to follow have to implement national registers this is not this is not a done deal this is being being currently discussed inside the EU but which makes it even more fantastic that while they discuss uh foreign ages or a, a registration law for for NGOs and for foreign funding from NGOs they also criticize Georgia for for exactly the same thing and they're getting away with it in the in the media BBC CNN and so on they all report the same so we are being gaslit at the moment obviously gaslit into believing that what Georgia does is is so bad and evil while we know that we have similar laws in the EU um do you have connections with anyone from these anti and and anti foreign agents law side? And do you understand their logic? Because there must be something behind that, right? At least from the Georgians on the ground. I just earlier today, before um, recording this uh, with you, uh, had a, a a lengthy conversation uh, with an expert, uh, um, an activist uh, who has written a lot about um, this law and 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 on Georgia. And um, one of the things we talked about, we touched on that uh, when I saw that first political article um, uh, where Ursula is standing, uh, there's a photo of her and uh, she's basically telling uh, the EU members to adopt this law, that this law is necessary. But I'm paraphrasing the article here, obviously, but this process is taking place, right? Um, and uh, she was telling me uh, that to be surprised that you know Brussels can be hypocritical about these things would be sort of waste of your breath or even waste your emotions on it because obviously there is 
you know, you know, deep hypocrisy, palpable hypocrisy here. Um, so what does they tell us? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I know that, um, uh, you know, uh, some legal uh, experts uh, understand that there are problems and this law needs to be sort of polished up uh, to to make it as 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 uh, liberal as possible, uh, meaning as you know, uh, sensitive to uh, defense of uh, rights of these NGOs uh, as as it is possible. Um, now, without going into legal, uh, you know, uh, details, um, to what do we attribute this, right? Um, because in and of itself, this legislation uh, is not supposed to create a an environment uh, that. Uh, uh, jeopardizes the, the statehood of Georgia, right, with another potential revolution, right? This is just a legislation. And if those who oppose it and especially claim that they are truly pro-Western liberal Democrats, right, ideally they would have to probably wait this out if they don't like it, do what they can within a democratic process to defeat the current government, take over the reins of power, come into the parliament and veto this law down, right? Get rid of this law. But do it through the diplomatic, uh, to, through the democratic process, which is surprising that they're not doing it because they are the ones who are, you know, pro-Western liberal Democrats, right? What do this government? What does this government know? This is a pro-Russian dictatorial state, right? Um, so uh, that's another sort of absurd aspect of this entire process that this law is simply not worthy of yet another revolution in Georgia, or uh, it's just there is no substance behind it that should, that justifies yet another uh, you know specter of revolution in Georgia. Um, so obviously, this is very much ideologically driven. Uh, this is neo neoliberal concert of you know of political powers uh, that. Uh, cannot stand the thought of Georgia not jumping or asking or telling them that they're not going to jump as high as they want them to jump anymore. This is as simple as that. Um, and obviously, uh, they understand that this the Georgia is getting away from them. But here is the here is a counterintuitive point here for many. Uh, I don't think they can do much about this. I don't think Brussels or Washington can do much about this, no matter how much they scream and yell and criticize this current government. Um, because let's remember, uh, this is all happening uh, under the shadow of Russia, right? Of what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. And this is all happening uh, with uh, the idea that uh, Georgia cannot be let go as the last frontier, as the potential frontier uh, uh, to be weaponized against, against Russia. Um, so this is a very uh, geopolitical uh, sort of cynical side to it behind behind uh, this this uh, uh, theater that we are watching unfold um, uh, and hysteria really. Uh, so uh, you know, in terms of uh, the United States uh, being able to come up with a solution as they see it fit, they really don't have any options. Um, the worst case scenario, I'll ask this question you know, to my colleagues uh, before, uh, is that, you know, since they accuse the current government of closing up with Russia and they're pro-Russian, therefore, right, so they want to join Russia and turn against the West, even though there is no evidence for it. Um, what's driving this is the fear that uh, Georgia won't be as flexibly utilized against Russia. Uh, and they think that that will might cause the United States uh, relative power to significantly decline. Um, so, but, you know, there's plenty of literature uh, on this subject, how small states basically need to survive. This is why we study international affairs, right? To, to understand the concept of state survival, which is the sort of heartbeat of international system. Um, uh, and the fact that Georgia has finally for the first time in 30 years, actually underlined that fundamental fact that national interest matters uh, is something that Washington has taken uh, in all the wrong ways, uh, foolishly so. Um, so you know, I so, hope they will snap out of it because it's just not making any sense. Uh, so, you know, in a, in a sense, maybe we can attribute this to the current 
um, all of the other self-defeating and and self-destructive policies that are being taken in the EU and in the US that are actively undermining the the structure the US has been building over the past, right? It, it the US is overflexing its its muscles. It has been doing so with with Russia and with the sanctions, and we mm -hmm. see the sanctions do not work. They're not not as if they worked. They had worked very well before although i spoke to an iranian colleague yesterday and he said like although iran did not collapse it the sanctions were successful over 40 years to hurt iran significantly economically and in its development it couldn't develop the, the way it should have over the past 40 years and russia is now breaking out of that and did we see de-dollarization going on we see how the us is tearing down the institutions it has been it has been involved with not that it ever joined the icc but it, now it's actively fighting against it it's fighting against the wto it's 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 killing the uh, 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 appeal process so maybe georgia is just one more part in taking down this structure that used to work because <laughs> of some idea of over hubris and just to say the the unspoken thing out loud the, the supposition from people like us is of course yeah. that the us and europe want to kill that law because it would reveal how much money uh, Georgian NGOs receive certain NGOs, which would, of course, be trying to influence the political process in Georgia, right? It would just make that obvious, which at the moment can be hidden away. That's that's Correct. about right, isn't it? Correct. You cannot, yeah, you cannot make this case uh, without this major variable. I mean, we have to, there is a huge incentive for everyone who is protesting, well, the NGO class that's protesting, uh, to protest this, right? Because they'll be making lots and lots of money. Um, and there is a huge uh, financial reward. Uh, and uh, the, the, the person I spoke to today, we, we talked about uh, this whole idea that in normal sort of liberal consolidated democracies, um, you know, it, the role of NGO is not to overthrow a government. The role of NGO is to point out certain deficiencies, play a role of a healthy part of a civil society, um, you know, call it part of, you know, larger sort of checks and balances, that's fine. Um, but NGOs in, in, in Georgia have been weaponized. Uh, there is a, since the days of the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, uh, uh, which is basically the arm of the United States government. Uh, and even though they don't make policy, there is no denying. And folks like uh, Thomas DeWall and, uh, and Lincoln Mitchell and all them, they've one way or the other have written about this and have said, look, yes, of course, NGOs have played an enormous role in exasperating divisions uh, uh, and, and in Rose Revolution to begin with. Um, uh, you know, so there is financial sort of selfish motive here. Uh, and there is uh, uh, also loss of power uh, dynamics. Uh, uh, and uh, they and, and they justify this uh, by claiming that this is a pro-Russian move on part of the Georgian Green. Um, so, you know, leave that aside, sort of leaving that aspect, uh, you know, of possible reasons aside, sort of civil society uh, aspect of it aside. Um, there is also a fundamentally speaking uh, more ominous reason, right? There is geopolitics here involved. There is geopolitics that has been blatantly talked about uh, under this government uh, that if Georgia, um, since Georgia hasn't gotten any security guarantees from the United States, uh, Georgia basically has to look on its own uh, for its own survival. And the way to do it is to play, uh, you know, something that resembles a balance, regional balancing uh, act or uh, even bandwagoning if Georgia has to do it. Um, or uh, the other concept and that, that I work with, with the SSU, the Sohomi State University, uh, you know, turn the region uh, into this neutral space uh, where major regional powers and including the United States uh, with with uh, the Europeans, uh, Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, and all the three uh, South Caucasian states create this geopolitical environment uh, in which all the players uh, 
uh, will, uh, you know, will play a constructive role without competing against their own interests at the expense of Georgia. And if you notice what uh, Azerbaijan has done, Azerbaijan's balancing act and balancing foreign policy has produced miracles, really. Uh, you know, this is the first time ever that Azerbaijan doesn't have any foreign uh, foreign troops, meaning Russian troops, on its soil. In addition to uh, it uniting its own territory and restoring its sovereignty fully, uh, you know, with its latest recent war with Azerbaijan, I mean, with Armenia, which, which, uh, so, which, which the EU is super happy happy with and about, and and has said nothing about the autocratic uh, well, nature of, of of that regime, and the EU just like keeps trading and so on. There's no there's no problems with Azerbaijan, as far as I. Get. Well, as a, with Azerbaijan, the problem is that they're afraid that there will be a uh, this whole Turkic world developing, right? Mm. Under the under the leadership of Turkey and Erdogan, uh, Azerbaijan being the uh, uh, in the alliance of the uh, of this pan, you know, this alleged pan Turkism um, uh, of Erdogan that he tries to uh, uh, consolidate, establish, and consolidate in in the region, um, uh, and. Uh, Basically, control of geoeconomic, uh, geoeconomic, uh, you know, uh, 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 projects that have been uh, uh, that have been in place since the '90s, since the early 2000s. Um, and so Brussels is that's why we see uh, Macron's foolish attempts to sort of, uh, you know, um, encourage uh, Pashinyan, who is uh, the president of uh, Armenia. Uh, to again use, you know, to again sort of uh, uh, persuade him or, or 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 entice him into the into the Western sort of uh, you know European Union club or, or making him or making him promises that one day they will make Armenia. So if you see if you see how Russia has been ignoring Armenia, that's that's very telling. Russia has no fear that Armenia will ever become member of you know either NATO or the European Union, no matter what. You know, Macron says Armenia is a landlocked country and it is beholden to Russia's interests. Uh, so you see how the balance, uh, Russia changed the balance uh, against Armenia and supported Azerbaijan uh, to do, a, to do you know, to, to consider doing a favor for Turkey in terms of geopolitics because he doesn't want any, you know, any, any geopolitical regional conflicts with, with Turkey. And so these countries in the region are balancing each other. Uh, and reaching their respective goals. Uh, Turkey has always been between the East and the West, playing a perfect geopo geopolitical sort of balancing act. Russia recognizes this, gives the leeway, uh, geopolitical or so strategic leeway to Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is at, the, at that expense, uh, manages to restore its sovereignty fully for the first time since the break, since the late 80s when the war broke up between on, of Nagorno-Karabakh between Az Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, so Armenia now is uh, Azerbaijan now is fully restored its sovereignty. No one here talks about this, by the way. It was like a geopolitical miracle that happened uh, in in the region. Uh, so the region um, is really returning to its core, uh, uh, which is geopolitics and resolving problems through geopolitics, uh, dealing with your immediate neighbors as they are, not as the United States or Brussels tells Georgia uh, uh, they they ought to be. Um, and Georgia sort of understanding that um, this blind adherence and hope that NATO one day will come and get Georgia, which was a myth to begin with. There is no NATO in Georgia. We know that. We know that much. Maybe a, a, a slightly more uh, you know, chance Georgia has to join the EU, uh, perhaps, even though the probability of it is still very low. Um, so instead of hoping that you know, George W. Bush's freedom agenda will you know, one day come come alive and true, they have to realize that that idealist sort of ideologically driven foreign policy has done tremendous damage to Georgia and Georgia's sovereignty. I'm not saying this is the only reason Georgia's problem started from the late 80s and early 90s with Russia, but what happened, say for, again, to return to the example of Saakashvili between 2003 and 2012, when Saakashvili left Georgia, he left Georgia with a, with a, in a much worse geostrategic position and weakened position, geopolitically speaking, than uh, he inherited it from Shevardnadze. Uh, because after he left and the disastrous 2008 invasion of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of Russia into Georgia, um, 
left those two separatist re uh, uh, regions uh, recognized by Russia as official statelets belonging to Russia now as independent. Um, uh, so before that, these two regions were not recognized, uh, right? So there was still some negotiation, which would have been much easier. Now it's even yeah. much more difficult. So uh, geostrategically speaking, uh, that one directional foreign policy that Georgia has pursued has been disastrous for it. So, you know, we and we talked about this the first time we talked, and I think I labeled that video the one the one who got away, in a yes. sense, Georgia walking away yes. from the brink. And 2008 made everything worse. And it is an established fact by a independent fact-finding mission from the UN under Heidi Tagliavini, cool. uh, who went and and figure and and officially stated no, it was the Saakashvili uh, forces that fired the first shots and then things developed. But this 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 approach, which clearly was a reaction to Saakashvili trying to test the new waters, because in 2008 also the Bucharest summit announced against the will of, of, of Merkel and Hollande and, and others that Georgia and Ukraine would become future members. Saakashvili tested it and clearly NATO didn't had nothing, no way of actually doing anything. Right. Um, and hence the Russians actually capitalized on the situation and made everything worse for Georgia. Uh, right. where you had a conflict before, an unresolved conflict, and then you had really uh, like an incursion and parts of the the territory de facto gone, right? And right. this is what you're what you're saying that also a majority of Georgians understands now and through the vote because this is a dem was a democratic vote, right? For the for the Georgian Dream Party, um, actually says no, we need we need a more realistic approach toward managing this regional um, this regional environment. The yes. thing that that is that is weird to me is the president. Your president, this oh, lady, yeah. she's she's quite one of a kind. And let me just read this out to you in this a BBC article <laughs> yes. from today. It yes. says that um, knowing that she had run out of options to stop the government from passing the bill on Monday, Miss uh, Tsurabishvili, the yes. president, presented yes. a new charter, a charter which she said would be a plan to move Georgia towards Europe. And then a quote from her, to rebuild trust, we need a new political reality, a distinct unity, different elections, a different parliament and a different government, she wrote on X, Twitter. Oh, wow. Yes. The charter and BBC calls it a charter, not just mm -hmm. a, a word document that she's floating out. She, it's called a charter. A charter yes. Includes the abolition of laws, which she said were harming Georgia's chances of EU membership, as well as significant reforms designed to depoliticize the justice system and security services. Ms. Tsurabishvili invited all opposition parties to sign the charter before June 1st and go united into parliament elections in October. Mm -hmm. What do you make out of this? Yes. Uh, classic Tsurabishvili. Uh, look, uh, it's almost like a mandate now, right, that she's... Um, calling for this uh, to be institutionalized. Uh, um, she's a very difficult, um, she had, when she first, she was a French educated French, uh, I think, I believe she was born in France, or I'm, I'm not sure, but she's she was a French citizen and very much uh, uh, built her career in France uh, uh, and uh, knew, you know, couldn't really get along with her own people, to be honest with you. She was that you know, westernized, uh, um, and uh, it was always she was always known as on a personal level as very um, awkward in terms of her uh, relating to her own electorate and the Georgian people. Um, first, she allied with Saakashvili, then she burnt bridges there, so Saakashvili uh, sacked her, uh, and then she allied with uh, Ivanishvili, uh, which is one of the reasons when uh, I they. My colleagues here tell me that, oh, you know, this current government is fighting against this pro-Western president. Um, that is another false narrative because, uh, you know, she was, you know, she tried, you know, she, she couldn't find common ground with one of the most pro-Western uh, presidents, which was Saakashvili and his regime, right? You, you know, basically recognized uh, uh without question that he was this very pro-Western, you know, li you know, liberal uh, sort of reformer. Uh, but uh, she broke ties with him and allied with Ivanishvili, right? 
But Washington didn't really say and anything about Ivanishvili that. Ivanishvili is the guy behind Ivanishvili George is the Dream. He's guy. the strong man. He is the strong man who is, you know, being accused of being pro-Russian and Russian puppet, whatever. Uh, so now we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, now we're talking. First of all, that aspect of it is also very much politicized, right? Uh, Ivanishvili, actually, technically, he's an oligarch. I mean, you know, uh, uh, for the lack of a better word, uh, but. Uh, uh, the idea that he is actually, again, driving Georgia directly into Kremlin's uh, arms uh, is is just uh, exaggeration, to say the least. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, Zurabishvili's role uh, uh, has always been sort of conflict ridden uh, due to her lack, uh, you know, lack of ability to actually build quali political coalitions within her party. Uh, so it was for Saakashvili. Now it's uh, 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 Ivanishvili who went out of his way to make her, uh, you know, a president. Perhaps make her a president is a is not a correct way of uh, sort of analyzing the situation because she did become president. People elected her, uh, but they contributed enormous amount of financial uh, capital to to make sure that she became president. Uh, so, but when that was happening, Washington and Brussels were quiet because then apparently. You know, the government was not uh, kicking Zorabishvili out uh, and calling them, calling her sort of, a, you know, pro-Western or anti-Georgian, right? Um, then when things started to get, he you know, heated uh, between her and, and uh, the GD, that's when sort of the West uh, started to capitalize on that chasm that was developing. Um, but I would argue that... A, she's obviously based on the constitution. She's a symbolic figure. Uh, you know, she doesn't decide the foreign policy of Georgia, um, and it doesn't matter at this point what she does. So she can be used as a sort of a figurehead to, you know, you know, make Georgia look like it still has not gone over to the Russian camp uh, with her, you know, with her mandates and charters that she issues. Uh, uh, but in terms of concrete, having a concrete effect, uh, she's not deciding politics. Uh, and I think Brussels and Washington understand that perfectly. Uh, and they're just using her as a symbol, basically, uh, to egg on the current government. Uh, uh, you know, but uh, because she, she's acting as this queen of pro-Western, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, pro-Western Georgian foreign policy. That but so has she basically... Has she fallen out with Ivanishvili by now? I mean, oh, oh yes, yes, yes. And this is her pattern, basically. Uh, that's my point. But this is her pattern. So, so her basic survival strategy is now has to be to capitalize on that on that uh, prominence that she has as president and hope that something happens that catapults her in her in, in her own right into you know a, a comparable position to Saakashvili or Ivanishvili where she can command like the basically she where she becomes the leader of the opposition and then gets right. by, gets voted in through that or in absence of that have some Maidan uh, 2024 yeah. happen that then you know where somebody again says FDEU and 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 decides on who becomes the leaders of the new government I mean that that must be the, the rationale at the moment yeah, that is correct this is basically political theater and she wants to remain relevant and this is a perfect opportunity for her to remain relevant uh, that's the only way I can appraise this uh, uh, because uh, uh, Brussels understands that through her uh, they cannot achieve much. The law has already been adopted. Um, uh, and uh, she's just this symbolic figure uh, that the Brussels can use uh, to claim further that uh, uh, the only pro-Western po politician left over in Georgia, left in Georgia is Zurabishvili. Um, so this is part of these false narratives and hysteria that we've been witnessing now uh, for the past few weeks and months. Um, uh, you know, uh, but um, behind the scenes, uh, I don't mean to be all conspiratorial here, but everyone understands uh, that Zura Bishvili's role is still beholden to this government. Uh, and if she loses next elections, I think it's five years in Georgia for presidency. Um, Has she just come into power? When did she come? 
she, she, she came to president. power, I would, uh, what was this? Uh, 2020, I believe it was, or 20, I don't quote. So she has only, uh, only about one or two five years year, left on five, her mandate. Yes, five year time period, correct, correct. Um, uh, but uh, her, her position is really unimportant. Um, what's important is what uh, the prime minister does. Uh, and what's important is what Ivanishvili is doing, actually, uh, behind the scenes, which, by the way, we have to be objective here and say that that also created a lot of um, uh, fair criticism. Uh, I've always said that Ivanishvili's role played a negative political, created a negative political mood in Georgia, um, especially uh, from the outside, um, uh, within you know within Washington and Brussels, uh, but Ivan Shvili basically did this to himself uh, uh, because there was no other choice. Uh, Saakashvili lost, and the GD came, and without Ivan Shvili, GD would not have been in power. And because there had to be a continuation of the government, uh, Ivan Shvili used his enormous financial resources to make sure that would take place, that they would consolidate power. Uh, because continuation of Saakashvili was just intolerable at this point. People were just were, were you know, dying for change. Um, uh, but nevertheless, his role, uh, when he came back as prime minister, then first he was elected, obviously, and then he left and then he came back. And just this whole, it creates this aura and this negative image that this guy is living, you know, in a suburb somewhere in a village in Georgia. And he is, you know, uh, uh, ruling the country behind the scenes. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, politically speaking, uh, they've been winning elections. Uh, that's a fact uh, since 2012, both parliamentary elections and, and local elections. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, you know, at this point, uh, you know, uh, I believe that uh, Georgian Dream will weather this, uh, they will survive this, uh, uh, you know, this onslaught uh, from the West. And uh, uh, the next step would be for them to pay attention uh, or to how they will use this law. If they start to abuse this law and if they start to basically uh, uh, you know, it, they start to basically uh, uh, crack down on civil society. Crack down on civil society and meet the expectations or prognosis of, you know, this pro-Western, you know, neocon, neoliberal uh, uh, original complaints about this law, then they will politically lose. So they have to really make sure that uh, that does not happen. Uh, of course, they will utilize, they will use that law. It just depends uh, how diplomatically and how liberally, how liberal they will be in terms of checks and balances. Um, but um, you know, let's just uh, hope and see. But uh, you know, they're not out of the woods yet in in in, in that regard. Uh, but then I just want to I just want to uh, finish this point by saying uh, they've asked me, uh, you know, do you think they will abuse the law to the point where uh, the Rose Revolution will take place? Well, they're forgetting Russia's role in the region, which is incomparably stronger today than it was prior to 2008 or during 2008. Uh, and uh, Russia already adopted the law saying that any signs, serious signs of another, you know, color revolutions in the region uh, will be equivalent, uh, will give them the reason to come in militarily and nip it in the bud, basically. Um, uh, so I do not see this unfolding any further than that, uh, because mm -hmm. right, because because uh, look, worst case worst case scenario, what is Washington going to do if 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 Tbilisi and Moscow find the common ground where, say, for example, hypothetically speaking, they will start talks about restoring Georgian sovereignty as a as a sort of a, uh, not a payback but a uh, as a return of favor from Moscow. Uh, for Georgia's uh, sort of keeping uh, itself neutral uh, uh, and not engaging in, you know, uh, in sanctions against Russia uh, and withstanding this pressure from the West. Let's just, let's just imagine that hypothetically speaking, they restart talks about restoring Georgia's sovereignty, which is the key issue, the core issue. Uh, what will be the scenario uh, that will unfold vis-a-vis -vis Washington, right? I mean, will, will Washington sabotage it? Will Washington stay away or will it actually help the process? Right. And you and know that, that will be the that will be the the revealing moment, right, of what actually was uh you know 
what liberal democracy and liberal sort of neocon, neoliberal concert and, and the system of neoliberalism uh, under Washington entailed and meant. We should write a paper about this because I'm just realizing that there is an that there is an enormous potential, diplomatic potential, and a historical parallel. If yeah. Russia started a process to normalize relations with Georgia and find find a, a solution to these two to these two provinces, because that would have a huge effect toward huge. toward you know how to solve Ukraine, and there is a historical parallel, which is what so the Soviet Union did with Austria. It ignored Austria for like. Five, four or five right. years after the Second World War until right. it realized and it tried to sell neutrality to Germany said like uh, even under Stalin we would accept the unified uh, Germany in, in 52, 53 the Stalin notes yes. and yes. ignored Austria and only in 55 after Stalin passed away the, the a couple of people in, including Khrushchev uh, uh, yeah Khrushchev started to realize that um, if we if we actually make an example out of Austria that we are willing to accept its neutrality and have an agreement with them, then maybe we can push Germany over the finishing line, which mm -hmm. didn't happen. It went right. the other way, but that's because it was too late. It was too Correct. late. Correct. Uh, Correct. So, I mean, in Georgia, there would be a huge potential for like creating a diplomatic fact that that uh, Russia is willing to to negotiate and so on and, and find a solution and, you know, take away all of this hubris from the West. But uh, then again, like Russia is not about, it's not about public messaging but they, this will exactly. be a diplomatic route no if they because well well people on the ground in georgia are talking about this uh certain experts uh journalists uh they you know they've mentioned this and this has been sort of anecdotal evidence that such ideas are circulating around uh and they're basically saying that this is exactly why they did this uh, in georgia mm -hmm. the law was basically a pretext to say you know we need to step back and um uh, look at our own sort of uh, security uh, situation. Uh, and since the West has failed to provide the security, uh, and we have to do whatever we can, uh, regionally speaking, obviously, uh, to, uh, uh, to make sure that we, we increase the guarantees of security as much as we can from Russia. And, if, and vice versa, if Russia sees that Georgia is guaranteeing that there will be no more NATO and these color revolutions will be prevented in Tbilisi from happening. Uh, and Russia, you know, Georgia guarantees Russia that this security problem uh, will, uh, you know, be over. Um, then, yes, uh, the whole idea is to sort of engage in some reciprocity uh, and uh, start talking about uh, uh, what can be done about reincorporating South Ossetia and Abkhazia into the Georgian proper and making it a part of Georgia as a sovereign as sovereign entities uh, with within their cultural sociocultural sovereignty, uh, but uh, you know, but under the Georgian Constitution, of course. And if that happens, and this is a big if, it's a long, long ways to go still. Uh, but uh, it's quite uh, uh, you know reasonable to assume that this might be the case. This might be sort of the beginning of that process if it ever materializes. Um, so. Then will be that you know the real sort of the gravy of the situation. Then will be to watch what America does, to watch what Brussels does. Right afterwards, uh, will they really? There will be a sort of a test for them uh, because all for the past three years uh, they've been talking about you know how much they want Georgia to be um, fully Georgia sovereign to be fully restored and an independent state. Well. If Russia holds that key, and many strategists think that it's only Moscow that holds that key, basically, especially now where Moscow doesn't really listen to what Washington tells it anymore, um, uh, then it will be a you know sort of a strategic test to see what the Washington does. Yeah, Washington has unfortunately a history of throwing wrenches into such processes, which was basically another Minsk process. <laughs> How <laughs> ironic would that be? How deeply cynical would that be if, if you know, if everyone found out that it was Washington that sort of sabotaged the process, right? Um, well, I mean, that's what we know about Ukraine and about about Istan, the Istanbul process. Right. I mean, it's very sad, but we have to deal with these realities and we have to factor them in. Yes. Um, yes. So, yes. Sub yes. Western sabotage would be definitely something. Yes. In 
Uh, the, the, um, unfortunately, this kind of process is probably at the moment not popular with the Georgian uh, uh, general public, right? Because the anti-Russian sentiments are, uh, is my guess, quite strong, right. aren't they? Well, anti-Russian, well, you, you'll be surprised. Anti-Russian sentiments overall are, but, and even though they want uh, Georgia to join NATO overwhelmingly, uh, the population recognizes basically that this is a dream. And res mm. restoration and you know, guarantees of security uh, by doing deals with Russia is more important uh, than waiting yeah. for yeah than waiting for NATO yeah. to come in. Yeah, what, 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 yeah. what, I, what I mean is, you know, all the West would need or what, what all Washington needs is about 10 percent who viscerally hate. Uh, Russia and then would be willing to together go to the street, right? And have, have right. Not, not thousands, but if you have 200,000 people on the street, well, well, then, then you can like, even if you're a small minority, you can, you can, you can derail such processes. That's, mm. that's what's going through my mind. That's what the hope is basically. Yeah. yeah. But then again, Russia will prevent that from happening. Uh, yeah. 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 But, but then, yeah. then any kind of, process can be derailed that way anyhow um yeah. we are we are firmly into in the in the space of of conjuring up possible futures well, this is um, all hypothetical but i think it's all we hypothetical have to, we have to go yeah. there just for an yeah. yeah um lasha i would like to thank you very much for for your analysis today and 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 the the overview and we will talk again once something comes up in georgia um can people follow you somewhere on twitter or what's what's the best way to i need to get my i need to develop my x account uh yeah but uh yeah we're working on that so we'll see what happens all right so we'll all right uh, everybody um thank you very much lasha thank you and see you next time thank you very much pascal appreciate you